Welcome, I'm your host, Walt Schemmel, and this is being brought to you by the FAA Production Studios and the FAA Safety Team National Resource Center located in Lakeland, Florida at the Sun and Fun Complex. Our next presenter was born in Cape Town, South Africa, and grew up in Europe. She graduated from Emory-Riddle Aeronautical University and is currently working on a master's degree in aeronautical science. She holds an ATP with type ratings and a 757 and a 767. She joined the FAA 10 years ago and is currently the FAST team manager for Eastern Region and is very familiar with the DC airspace. Her topic is airspace deviations. Let's welcome Karen Arendt. Karen? Thank you. Appreciate it. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming. As you know, uh, we are the FAST team. We are in the business of helping pilots reduce deviations. So instead of talking to you today about regulations and policy, we are going to be talking about how to identify hazards, assess risk, and reduce the possibility of a pilot deviation in our operations. As you can see, this program is including air traffic, flight standards, and the FAST team. We are providing it to safety professionals for education and awareness. So why are we here? Discuss a review of the data and a review of the action items. So first thing is do not risk a midair. This is actually from the Bureau of Land Management, Department of Forestry. Do not want to risk a violation. And we do not want to approach to investigate. Those are all covered in our NOTAMs. A pilot deviation is an action of a pilot that results in the violation of a federal regulation or a North American aerospace defense tolerance. That is actually security airspace. Most of our airspace is covered under uh, the operating rules of Part 91. And the special flight rules area is covered under Part 93. Due to the complexity and extent of the surface incidents, it will not be covered in today's briefing. Pilot deviation reduction requires partnership. Controller's primary responsibility is the safe, expeditious, and oh, uh, safe airflow uh, of traffic. Department of Homeland Security is responsibility is to monitor traffic. Uh, and ensure that there's protection of persons and property. Pilots have an equal responsibility in supporting the procedures that Department of Homeland Security and air traffic are combining to produce. As we notice, our airspace is increasingly complex. So what used to be a simple operation now involves significant additional responsibilities on the part of the pilot and the controllers. We've got special use airspace. The prohibited and restricted airspaces are promulgated under the regulations. Military operating areas alert and controlled firing areas are available for reference in the AIM, but are generally uh, noted also in 
and on the charts. Temporary flight restrictions are just as the name implies, temporary in nature and are notified via NOTAM. The special flight rules area and the flight restricted zone is now stipulated in the regulations. As of February the 17th, 2009, the special flight rules area became recodified and is now permanent airspace. We are now looking at the systems operations security. It's actually SysOps. As those of you who were here noticed uh, that they produced this slide, is that we are have very short notice uh, notams. They are requested in response to the aviation safety needs, the separation of aircraft for disaster type occurrences. So, uh, for instance, this is a fire type TFR NOTAM, which is given out at short notice. It might be routed through ATC and it might be less than three hours, for instance. The uh, TFR is defined both laterally and vertically and is off limits to non-participatory aircraft. So what we get to notice is the nature of the event, whether it's security or disaster. The existing airspace, which that TFR may overlie, for instance, in a Class B airspace, it may overlie oh, uh, the existing Class B. So what we want to be careful about is ensuring that if we don't have that clearance into Class B, that that clearance is obtained before entry. And one of the concerns in establishing a TFR is the possible consequences on, on, on air commerce and aviation commerce. TFRs are not restricted to circles, polygons, and racetracks, which is one of the options. They can be placed anywhere at any time and may be any one of these particular shapes. This is just to show you that what used to be perhaps uh, an oversight of an existing operating rule, which was promulgated under 91.123, for instance, is oh, uh, not following an ATC instruction uh, that may have been, for instance, treated as a, oh, uh, as a uh, uh, counseling incident, is now treated as a special security deviation and carries with it a penalty and possibly a criminal penalty. The thing that we have to keep in mind here is that the defense area is protected and that means that a pilot operating inside of that security related airspace is expected to abide by those uh, security requirements and carries with it additional penalties. A typical presidential TFR may be 10 miles in the center, extending to 30 miles to the outside, and extends up to 18,000 feet. The presidential TFR that we used to have in the Washington DC area uh, extended to 30 nautical miles was changed in August of 2007 and has maintained that shape and is now the special flight rules area. Well, see, this is what the aid is, the air defense identification zone was reconfigured in August of last year 
2007 is now still 30 nautical miles. But you notice in the northwest corner is the Leesburg maneuvering area that has a separate set of operating requirements. That uh, special flight rules area goes out to 30 nautical miles as the outer ring, and the inner ring is approximately 15 nautical miles. It was initially based on the Washington Monument and is now centered off of the DCA VOR. This airspace, as I said, is covered under Part 93, has a training requirement under 91-161. Any pilot operating within 60 nautical miles of the DCA VOR, VFR must take the training and present the certificate upon request. This is the number of USAID's breaches and shows an increase in the number of breaches, especially over the last year. I spoke to the issuing office for this data and asked them the question, and their response was that there was an increase in the number of surveillances offshore. We will see in one of the ASRS reports that there is more scrutiny along the borders as well as internally uh, inside of the United States. The term breach is used to define an inadvertent entry into the airspace that's not been uh, processed yet. So we're not looking at violations. This is just the initial report on the 8020-17 by ATC. As we're looking inside of the Washington Special Flight Rules area, we'll notice the high-risk airports and their high risk as they have an increased number of operations. Leesburg, due to its location and its complexity, and also because it's got a set of different procedures, has had more breaches than the other, the most breaches of the other airports uh, that are located in and around the special flight rules area. Leesburg has a unique structure and because of the fact that it's located outside of this, in a cutout outside of the special flight rules area, those procedures are actually obtained online at FAAsafety.gov under the uh, navigating the new DC special flight rules area, or what we used to call the air defense identification zone. This shows where airspace deviations by state shows that the Washington DC area has definitely incurred most of the pilot deviations. We are looking at 72% in eastern region uh, within Washington, D.C. And the, the other two states are New York and Maryland. Again, P-40 has had a number of pilot deviations in that airspace and New York, which is fairly complex. They followed up with the additional 15% of the pilot deviations in uh, the eastern seaboard. Here we see trend per 100,000 hours of operation. The FAST team is looking to reduce the pilot deviations by 10 percent from 350 to 315 uh, by the year 2009. This trend includes the runway incursions, deviations. The special flight rules area is covered under Part 93, and we talked about the operating rules of 91-123 as well, is that in order for a pilot deviation to be recorded, it must be 
in contact with ATC, and ATC makes that, provides that report. Many of the deviations that are occurring occurs while a pilot is actually under his own navigation and is in fact not talking to ATC. And ATC we must view as in fact a, a friend of ours and can provide us assistance to avoid the pitfalls of entering into uh, this airspace. Just showing you this slide so that you can see the actual accident rates, even though we've had no accidents inside of the uh, special flight rules area or special use or restricted airspace, uh, we still look at the accident rates because sometimes we'll see that the symptoms of an accident occur well before the accident actually happens. So where's the balance? This was the Department of Homeland Security and National Capital Region conducted a report, a congressional report in September of 2005 and they agreed that a risk management approach to identify airspace controls and security measures to offset the number of pilot deviations should take place. They're concerned also that a aviation commerce continue and not be affected and that the balance of the limitations that they're placing on that airspace uh, be weighed by the, oh, uh, this is security concerns in that airspace. And therefore, we had to meet the security needs and maintain a vibrant GA community inside of that airspace. So finding the right balance was the real concern here. So we're looking at the evolution of safety thinking is what direction are we going to take to, to try to reduce these deviations. Looking at the technical factors, the crash fix fly crash syndrome where an aircraft was designed, it could be replaced as a light aircraft and put back into service. You can't do that with a 747, 737. The evolution of thinking has changed. Now into human factors where they realize that interaction between the crews, communication, cockpit leadership uh, was developed, training and education improved, communication in the cockpit. Organizational factors, realizing that humans don't operate in a vacuum and therefore the organizational factors are, uh, provide the workplace conditions in which humans operate. So what we've done is taken this a step further and now applied an organizational structure to this oh, uh, and say to operators as well that uh, they can provide a safety culture in which to enable uh, pilots to operate safely. So taking this uh, step further in the physical barriers, obviously we can't place a physical barrier in that airspace and that the freedom to fly within the national airspace may be somewhat limited. So if the airspace limitations increase and the controls that we put in place are no longer effective, there is a possibility that the limitations are further increased. 99% of the airspace violations are committed by pilots who intended to stay out of the airspace and did so entered the airspace unknowingly. However, security also treats, that is Department of Homeland Security, is treating 
any inadvertent entry into that airspace as a potential threat to national security and is willing to pay a high price to eliminate uh, and reduce the possibility of inadvertent entry. Therefore, we're asking that general aviation respond collectively to the challenge of reducing pilot deviations and perform a risk analysis of their own. We realize that pilots are very concerned and for the most part adhere to the procedure. So we are approaching this from a hazard identification standpoint. Uh, just going back to that first uh, slide there, physical barriers in airspace cannot be placed there, obviously. Regulations and fines uh, have limited effectiveness, so now we're taking that a step further. We've got alerts and warnings. We've got the surface warning system already in place. However, education and training is where most of the effective outreach is going to take place. This is the scope of our challenge is 675,000 GA pilots, 221,000 registered aircraft, 18,000 airports. I did actually take the slide from, from the Office of uh, Runway Safety and Flight Standards and this has a particular con uh, application to airspace deviations as well because crucial information is not reaching the pilots. We can see in our search of the ASRS reports and those who don't know about the ASRS Aviation Safety Reporting System, it's a database that houses reports approximately uh, 30,000 reports are submitted each year. About 3,000 of those are entered into the database. Uh, they are used as a waiver of sanction by those pilots that submit them. But, and they're also de-identified. I've taken this report set and used the information to share with you how you can identify hazards in the airspace that you might be able to use in your own operation to identify the, a possible risk. In this particular case, the pilot with 500-hour five, uh, pilot entered Class B inadvertently. That's a common problem in the special flight rules area, is a pilot must hear the words that he's cleared in Class B. Uh, we can see the charts uh, don't always convey that information and considerable amount of effort must be taken to cross-reference that data. That is the information online, the information you receive from the AFD and the AIM, and also what's on the charts. April 2006, pilots en route from Cancun, Mexico to Mobile, Alabama and this is where I read the report, there was actually some information provided to that pilot that caused the pilot some consternation. Uh, he was uh, eventually oh, uh, told to contact Aniston, Texas to, uh, to ensure that he was going to receive uh, customs, he was going to have a customs oh, uh, guard uh, to meet him at the airport and give him a discreet code. He was concerned that he was going to be intercepted and he in fact uh, I believe was and he tried to do all the right things but what happened is that there was uh, some oh, uh, information that was not communicated uh, between the, the two air traffic sectors and, f and f uh, flight service. However, what we're asking is that in a similar situation, pilots placed to uh, make sure 
that the pilot communicates clearly with air traffic and makes their case known so that that's also on record. Recent ASRS pilot report, again, pilots checking NOTAMs for a flight three stops. Our uh, departure airport was Buffalo. He was going to land at uh, JFK and he was going on to Philadelphia. What happened is that the TFR was reinstated after his departure. Again, NOTAMs can be issued in short notice and we recommend, this came up in our last TRACON meeting this weekend, is that we recommend that you also monitor uh, the ATC frequencies, including 121.5, to get an update on the latest TFRs. Again, another TFR briefing. Pilot receives a note and briefing, but arrives in the briefed area again uh, the question about whether that TFR was active or activated while a pilot was en route. Going more on to the types of errors and active failures that a pilot can, it can uh, oh, uh, experience the perception errors. Micah Ensley is a psychologist Oh, uh, in her study, Perception, Comprehension, and Projection, uh, frequently we don't perceive the things, the message that was originally intended. So if we don't see it, we don't process it in our minds. Uh, that can be overcome with training and education as well as experience in that airspace. Memory lapses, a checklist is uh, certainly helpful in this situation. And slips, I didn't mean to do that. That's purely a human error. Things can go wrong. I can turn the wrong light on, the wrong light switch. Uh, wrong assumption, assume the situation was different. Technical misunderstandings and procedural violations. Technical misunderstandings, I try to do the right thing, but I didn't understand what I had to do. How can we avoid the technical misunderstandings? Part of that is overcome also by writing better procedures, also better checklists. They can be inadequate or they can be missing. Procedure violations, Nobody follows that procedure here. We can't get the job done if we do all of that. Where do you see that happen a lot where it's impossible to accomplish all of the tasks necessary to complete that process because there isn't sufficient time? So now we look at the organizational accidents. I'm just bringing this in because that points out to you that workplace conditions and active failures, oh, the active failures and latent conditions have their origins in organizational processes, which means that the human does not operate in a vacuum. The organization provides the processes, that's the training, the monitoring, uh, promoting of uh, both flight operations, dispatch, maintenance, all of those processes all, uh, uh, have their origins in, uh, in an organization. Therefore, the organization makes those workplace conditions and sets the tone and provides the tools for the, uh, to, to eliminate the threat. 
that means that some of those conditions can be, and the possibility of an accident uh, can be in place when the human is introduced to that equation. Couple this with the failure to anticipate the human error in a high tempo and complex operation. We put the defenses and the failure to put the defenses in place means that the organization and the workplace is prone to an accident. This basically just means that in an organization we have information flow from the bottom up and from the top down. If you've got a flight school that's operating in complex airspace, we need information both from the top, from management. Management is aware of what's going on from the top down, flight instructor, pilot community. From the pilot community is, uh, is aware of, uh, of all of the flight training, education, standard operating procedures, and checklists that are required for that operation to be effective. So recognizing risk in the workplace, the FAST team, that's the FAA through the FAST team, is proactively developing uh, accident, incident, or uh, deviation intervention strategy using system safety concept that was originally designed uh, for inspector tr string training in 2005. And what we, in the, uh, the congressional report study, is that they, they identified that there were vulnerabilities oh, uh, to, to uh, operations, and that through that, the use of risk management, they could identify that risk and the vulnerabilities to the airports in that, that protected airspace. In the same manner, what we're asking is that pilots identify, that conduct uh, or uh, risk management to expose the vulnerabilities of threats when flying in the national airspace system. And we can do that both proactively or, uh, and reactively. When we say reactive, means that we have to have that information up front to identify where those hazards are and then act on that information and design our procedures accordingly. So this is, this is looking at this knowing that there is risk exposure, uh, particularly between the people that do the job, that is fly the airplanes, and the procedures that we've designed. Risk mitigation and reduction. This is actually a fairly complex slide because what we've done is closed all those loops. We've said we've recognized risk we know that the regulations are, uh, that the FAA continues to provide regulatory oversight. But since regulations alone require intensive surveillance for performance assurance, the FAA is developing programs and guidance to help operators develop their own tools to mitigate risk of being involved in an accident an incident or a deviation. Symptoms of environmental weaknesses are, appear well before an accident, an incident occur. And the chain of events before an accident can be interrupted before uh, actually developing into a, a catas catastrophic consequence. So pilot deviations don't actually fall into the category of physical harm. However, we recognize that pilots uh, are subject to 
increasing workload in this airspace. And that it can, to the, in a high stress environment, get to the point where a pilot's cognitive abilities uh, may be compromised. So the FAA is determining the viability of procedures, charts, and training to meet the functional demands of flight within protected airspace and to conduct an oversight, uh, an assessment of the oversight system. So you as the pilot will be developing your own procedures inside the regulation and regulatory framework so that we can make sure that guidance, education, and training that we provide also works for you. It basically says that we can keep, in, we can keep up the number of pilot deviations and it's not going to be the same as getting information on runway incursions because we don't see the type and the number of incursions. So we're going to look at what Flight Standards is doing to identify what the root causes are because we are very concerned that you are getting the training that is going to mitigate these pilot deviations and is appropriate for your operation. So if we are looking at collecting this data to make our own procedures better, we are going to look at information that comes from the GA community, those that have pilot deviations. We are going to fix what is wrong. In the same manner, you are going to fix what is wrong in your own operation and if you have had a violation or if you are aware of the vulnerability to risk of inadvertent entry in the controlled airspace in the, any of these restricted airspaces, uh, that you know what they are up front. You take that information and you actively identify hazardous conditions through the flight risk tool. You can take that information a step further and you can infer how that might affect your operation in the future through predictive analysis. So if we look at the ADAS, the flight restricted zone, we see there's 17 airports and inside the inner ring there are three airports that are called the DC-3. They have a separate set of operating requirements. If you're not aware, you actually have to obtain a, a PIN number, background check, and obtain clearance from ATC in advance, although both do. This requires significant preparation ahead of your flight. Tipton Army Airfield, you say, how does this really affect me? We talked about physical harm as uh, an outcome of the catastrophic consequences of operating in, in this restricted airspace. There's a pilot that took off from Tipton Army Airfield on October 12, 2006. He was flying a PA-46 Malibu. He could not obtain a clearance on the ground. He had filed an instrument flight plan. He took off and decided he was going to get his clearance in the air. Tipton Army Airfield, for their, those of you who don't know its location, it's the northeast side of the Special Flight Rules area. It operates inside of a notch, you can see. And <clears throat> it is a congested airport as is that entire airspace area. This pilot took off and this is the report of his conversation with the controller. November 9130, November, you are skulking 1200, is that correct? So he took off without obtaining 
a discrete code before takeoff. Remember, that's a requirement from takeoff. You file an ADIS flight plan. If you file an IFR flight plan, you're not required to get an ADIS flight plan, but remembering that you have to have one on file if you're intending to fly VFR. He took off VFR. He contacted ATC. He was squawking 1200. Pilot responds, Roger that. You are violating the ADIS. The controller says you are violating the ADIS. You need to land at Tipton immediately, and I'll give them your FO number for air defense. Pilot responds, landing at Tipton immediately, 30 November. Controller, 30 November, I'm too busy to give you that number. Maybe you'll get away. Just turn it off and land and call us on the phone for your clearance. And the pilot responds, Roger. The pilot was last seen turning onto a left downwind and then disappeared from the radar scope. There were two persons on board, a passenger and the pilot, two fatalities. Turned out three years or two and a half years prior to that, the pilot had already paid a fine for an, a violation. And that was inside of the ADIS at that time. This was pictures of the accident. The NTSB report stated that contributing to contributing evidence to the crash was the pilot's self-induced pressure to land. And that's the report number. Just to illustrate to you that there are significant psychological stressors on the pilots and additional workload expectations. Inside of that airspace, we talked about Leesburg Executive Airport. I've got the, just to show you the breaches from the Leesburg Airport since uh, August of 2007 until this year, in the last 12 months, we saw an increase of 78% in the number of pilot deviations just due to the changes also in those procedures. As you can see, what has improved is that the eastern border of the Leesburg Maneuvering Area is now identified by the, a closer VOR RML 004 at 16.6 .6 miles. That really helps pilots identify where it is. Again, specific operating requirements is a, is a code 122.6 outbound and 122.7 inbound, and a discrete code while operating in the traffic pattern. Must file an ADIS flight plan, must be talking to ATC, we're not talking to CTAF oh, uh, in the immediate operating area. This airspace is provided for ingress and egress only. Any operation outside of that airspace must be on a discrete code. Again, fairly simplistic actions to operate in the ADAs, but they belie the complexity of the actual procedures. This is a shift to permanent airspace, as we know, on September the 17th. This airspace here is also the special flight rules area for the rest of the airspace. Action of flight standards was to enhance the and provide a deviation group to enhance the understanding of pilot deviations. It helps us determine the root cause of these pilot deviations. That's through AFS 800. This is uh, our actions in the next 12 months. We are carrying out these outreach programs through the flight instructor refresher clinics. And we have published a notice 8900.48, restating the importance of awareness of pilot deviations.
This is the deviation, pilot deviation work group announcement on notice 8900. What AFS 800 is doing is redesigning block 18 of the Pilot Deviation Report Form 8020-18. And we'll be asking that inspectors that issue a pilot deviation to or take the call, we'll be asking pilots to provide information specific to their operation. For instance, on fatigue, time in make and model, that will help us better design training. We're working with 800 to determine the root causes and that's the FAST team. Short term actions, I'm going to go through this fairly quickly, I've got 15 minutes left, but just to let you know, search the ASRS databases. If you are with an organization, provide a feedback response from the pilots in your organization. Assign mentor pilots uh, at high risk airports. Look at your own procedures, your manuals, and your cockpit uh, checklists to identify elements that can contribute to pilot distraction. For instance, if you have a 1200 code, you want to change that checklist uh, for a discrete code, for instance, to contact ATC. Scenario-based training. We know scenario-based training will work if that pilot has received basic good foundation in systems, maneuvers, and procedures that you've stated the, oh, uh, the objectives and the completion standards that's a scripted scenario and oh, uh, increased subjective oh, uh, subjection to high workload environment. Working with ATC will also help that pilot better assimilate in that airspace. Safety meetings, feedback through and identifying hazards through root cause analysis, have the distractions been identified? Is there a, a plan, for instance, to identify hazards and remove some of the distractions? Talked about negative habit transfer. Air traffic controllers are humans. They are also subject to error. Oh, uh, you may be given a, uh, a call for instance, to maintain current squawk code after canceling IFR. If you don't hear the words maintain current squawk code, don't change to 1200. Maintain your current squawk. And that's specific to the special flight rules area. Law of recency and repetition. Oh, uh, we all carry baggage from our past and that applies to a new situation is that the SFRA requires a different mindset. If we're used to filing an instrument flight plan, we no longer have that capability to just simply uh, go to another school code. Our transponders are monitored by the security folks in this airspace. So it's no longer business as usual. No VFR corridor, again, used to be an airspace uh, between DCA and, and oh, uh, Dulles. That corridor is no longer available for VFR transient operations. It is a special, it is the flight restricted zone. So while you may be clear to enter into the special flight restricted area, the flight res restricted zone is not available for transient operations. In fact, there's a lot of traffic in between DCA and Dulles and ATC, be prepared. ATC will route you around, take plenty of fuel, plan ahead. We talked about the VFR corridor. Outreach to pilots, FAAsafety.gov. That 
training is taken online. You can download the certificate and you may be asked to present it. If you are and you don't have it on you, you may go back and print out a copy and present it as long as you have already completed that training. And that training requirement went into effect on February the 9th. All takes place on fasafety.gov. You must be registered and you must take the training. SAFO and INFO. The SAFO is particularly pertinent to critical safety of flight information for air operators, part 142 flight schools. INFO is less critical in nature. However, we have the flight risk tool on the INFO site. FAAsafety.gov, again, we want to get information about current TFRs. The best place is on airspace.nifc.gov, National Interagency Airspace. There's actually a correction in that slide needed. So what's next? Uh, <clears throat> I will pass that until we get to the next, to the second but last slide or last slide. Any questions from anybody in the audience? Let's see, is any, are, just like uh, Brian Neville said, are any of you risk takers? I'm going to see here if we can't go back here just a second. Okay, it looks like we have the info I was just going to show you, it's a, it's a tool available for you to identify hazards, assess risk. That means that you can make an inference of that hazard, whether it's applicable to your operation and whether it's going to occur and what the consequences of that occurrence is. And the flight risk tool is a great tool you can adapt in your own operations. And with that, that concurs my briefing. And just to let you know, I was over at the Wings, oh, uh, the temporary residence uh, out here on the side, is there's three computers. Those of you who have not taken the training Gold Systems has provided, and FAST team has provided those computers for us to do the training and have that PDF file submitted to us uh, on our email address. So for those of you, that availability is there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Interesting about all those airspace deviations and how we kind of get into them if we have a lack of knowledge of that uh, procedure and the operation of the system and how easy it is, maybe with the communications with ATC to kind of get sucked in as pilots and all of a sudden we realize we're in some place we shouldn't be. It's going to take some time, but eventually through better communication, as you mentioned, we're going to have the ability to get all that stuff instantly. And when one of those TFRs pop up, we won't inadvertently fly into it because we're going to see it in that glass cockpit and tomorrow we're going to be talking about flying those uh, glass cockpits and all the information available we'll see you at 8 30 tomorrow morning is our first presentation so y'all have a good evening come back up here have you got any questions for the speaker <laughs>